Discipleship is following Jesus with all my heart, having passion and following him no matter where he leads and letting him take control of my life. Giving to others what, from what we've been given, from our gifts. Discipleship is like when you're trying to like fulfill God's commands. Discipleship is total surrender to the Lord. It's not allowing anything to get in the way, but being totally sold out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Who was that handsome devil up there? <laughs> I, uh, last night I said, and it, it's true, I'm not Gene. And I'm not half as attractive as he is, and I heard a couple amens, so (laughs) that's awesome. But I do know that whenever somebody new gets up to speak, sometimes it can be a little bit uncomfortable. So I thought that I would put this on to make everybody feel a little bit more at home. So go Redbirds. (laughs) Just to make everybody feel a little bit more comfortable. (laughs) But uh, like we talked about earlier today, uh, we're starting our new series on discipleship. And if you guys would take out your outline here, it's an orange color. Um, What I wanted to start out with tonight is, or today, sorry, (laughs) still thought it was Saturday night. Uh, This morning is to turn it over on the back. And something that Gene and I were talking about whenever we met a couple weeks ago about uh, what I was going to preach on today We were talking about how discipleship, a lot of times people can distinguish between being a Christian and being a disciple. And so what I want you guys to write on the back of your outline is discipleship equals Christianity. Because a lot of times we think that once we come to know Jesus and we become a Christian, then we have to wait until we achieve this next level before we consider ourselves a disciple. When Jesus intended us, as soon as we have a relationship with him that we are his disciple. The two are equal. So if you would write discipleship equals Christianity because they are the exact same thing. And so, so many times we think that they're different. So many times we think that we may not be good enough to be a disciple or we just say, well, that's not for me or I'm not quite there yet. And the cool thing about it is whenever you think about the disciples, Most of those guys didn't have it together either. (laughs) I always think about Peter, and I just picture Jesus all the time being like, oh, Peter. You know, and just doing the face palm kind of thing, and just, oh, where did that come from, Peter, you know? And so we're all on this journey together. And so the thing that I was thinking about as we're talking about discipleship is the things that go and block what true discipleship is. And I was thinking about this time of the year. I love Christmas time. It's my favorite time of the year. It's where generous people become more generous, but then a lot of times you see people's true colors come out. I love Christmas, I love New Year's, but around Thanksgiving, I get a little bit disheartened just because we spend a whole night thinking about what we're grateful for, how much God has provided for us this last year, and then not, you know, five hours later, you hear about some poor Walmart employee who got trampled to death all for a TV set. And so what that got me thinking is that selfishness rules our society today. Our society is stricken with this epidemic of selfishness which hinders true discipleship. And so I was thinking about even even those electronics that, that people get trampled for, what are they called? iPod, iPad, iPhone. It all has to do with I. We've become so selfish as a society that we forget to give. We forget about helping one another. And so discipleship is all about service. And in 2014, I love this about New Year's, is because if we've been struggling there, and you start to see new people, you know, all those New Year's resolutions, like, I'm going to lose 50 pounds, right? And it lasts for about a week. You start getting on the treadmill or the little elliptical, and then all of a sudden, about a week later, you're like, ooh, hostess came back into business? What? You know I need to go celebrate, get me a box of Twinkies and Ding Dongs and have myself a party, you know, celebrate the good stuff. And so a lot of times, New Year's, we start to set these resolutions, we start to set goals for ourselves, but what I love about New Year's is that we get to set new goals, 
We get to change whatever we didn't like about 2013, and we get to start fresh. We get to start new. And so in 2014, we're talking about discipleship and what true discipleship is. So if you have your Bible, open up to Luke chapter 14. We're going to take a look at verse 25 and 26. And I love this passage. Whenever uh, Gene told me that I was going to be preaching, it was about February, and, uh, and I, I agreed. And then he said, you're going to be teaching on Luke 14. And he goes, don't worry, you have a whole year to plan for it, so no pressure. But as I read this, there's a lot of times that we can misplace or misinterpret what, uh, what this verse says. And so if you would, turn to Luke chapter 14, verse 25, and it says this. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around to them and said, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father and your mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And I was thinking about this because in some translations it just says, hate your mother, your brother, your father, your sister, everybody. And a lot of times people say, see, God told me it's okay to hate people. And that's not what it's saying at all. Even though it may be tempting, parents, how many of you guys had a WWE wrestling match with your children this morning trying to get them ready for church? You know what I'm talking about, where you put them in a headlock and you're trying to, you know, put their shirt on and you're like, just put your arm in the armhole, you know? I uh, babysat for some friends of mine and I had to get one of the little guys ready for school each morning and it was so tough trying to get him ready for school in the morning. It was crazy. And so there's a lot of times that we read this and it's kind of like, well, no, I know that that's not true. But sometimes it can be taken out of context where we think that, you know, God is being contradictory to each other. But in the New Living Translation, it says, by comparison, I love that, because it really explains it so that there's no way to misinterpret it. And so Jesus, I love this because whenever I read the scriptures, I always try to picture it almost like a movie. And so there's this massive crowd following Jesus, and all of a sudden he turns around and says, hate everything in your life if you want to be my disciple. And I always wondered what people's reactions were. Because he turns around all of a sudden, says that, turns back around, and what would the people think? They're here to see miracles. They're here worshiping the Lord. You know, they're following him. And then all of a sudden he says, hate everything if you want to be my disciple. And this isn't a new concept that Jesus is talking about. Because God in Exodus 20, verse 3, says, you must have no other gods before me. And then, not only that, but he takes it to the next level and he tells us that he's jealous for us. Whenever we allow anything to become more important, whenever we allow anything to be loved more than God, it says that he's very jealous. And in James chapter four and verse five it says, or do you think the scripture says without reason that he he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? And so what he's saying there is that Jesus so desperately wants to know you. He so desperately wants to have a relationship with you that he is jealous if we put anything before our relationship with him. Hate everything in comparison to me. Because our relationship with Jesus oftentimes is compared to that of a marriage. And whenever I think about that first time that you meet that special someone, isn't it kind of like, a little bit superficial. You first walk into a room and you're like, hey, who's that lady over there? I think I'm going to go talk to her. You know what I'm talking about? And so it starts out where it's just based on appearance. I was thinking about Adam and Eve. Whenever Adam, you know, he, he just gets put to sleep, God takes his rib, creates Eve. And then as Adam's coming to, he's waking up, God says, what do you want to name your wife? And he goes, whoa, man. And so then we got woman. I'm so glad that he chose woman (laughs) instead of hubba hubba because that would be awkward. (laughs) Do you take this lawfully, (laughs) this hubba hubba to be your lawfully wedded wife? You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) And so it would be awkward. And so he, he named her woman, but it was all based on like, whoa, that whoa factor. And so, so many times we start out a relationship superficially. And it's the same way that the people following Jesus were. You see, a lot of these guys were following Jesus because they wanted a miracle. 
They wanted him to heal them. He, they wanted to see somebody raised from the dead. They wanted to see the miracle. They wanted to see the show. They wanted to come and say, Jesus, what are you going to do to wow me today? I have a pin it. Whenever the Rockies first started, back in 92, 93, and I went to Mile High Stadium, and I have a pennant that hangs on my wall, and it says, inaugural season, I was there. And I think a lot of times, these people would want to come, and they would be like, Jesus fed the 5,000, I was there. Maybe even making like an I was there Jesus robe of the time, you know, where they could walk around, and I was there when Jesus fed the 5,000, you know, and, and so it was more of an entertainment. It was more of a, Jesus, what are you going to do for me today? And I think that there's sometimes in churches all over the world where people come to church for the same reason. They come to church to say, God, I need help with my finances. I need you to heal me, God. I need you to take care of all of my problems. I need, I need to have the best life possible, and I know that you want to give it to me. And so sometimes we take the scriptures that we want, but then the ones that say, I want you to sacrifice, we're kind of like, ah. And so Jesus is calling us to have a mature, a genuine, a genuine relationship with him. The same way that we would have with our husband or our wife. It starts out saying, oh baby, you know, looking good today. But then as you start to talk to that person, you start to realize who they truly are. You start to know their heart. You start to know them intimately. What makes them tick? But that only happens whenever you spend time talking with them and listening to what they have to say to you. And it's our, the same way in our relationship with Jesus. The more time that we spend with him is the better that we get to know him. So that is why it is so important that we are in our Bible every single day, that we're praying constantly, is because we want to get to know Jesus on an intimate level. We want to have an intimate, genuine relationship with him. And that's what Jesus challenges as he talks to, to the crowd. He says, hate everything in comparison to me. But then in the next verse, Verse 27, it says this, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. And so Jesus challenges them by, by asking them to go deeper, to take ownership of their relationship with him. Because in a marriage, you have to sacrifice. It's fourth down, one yard to go, right? Right on the goal line, four minutes left. And then you hear that you're, child needs help with his homework. And you're like, hmm, kind of caught in the middle here, right? But don't you sacrifice for your kids? Or your wife comes in and says, honey, we need to talk. You have to sacrifice. Moms, you guys sacrifice all the time. Working full time, a lot of you, and then coming home, getting the house clean, kids ready, washed up for dinner, dinner on the table, all these different things. And so you're always constantly sacrificing for the ones that you love. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Take up your cross and follow me. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. He calls the crowd to deny themselves, to give up everything that they keep putting in front of him. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, he says, If anyone should come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But then, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. What does it mean to deny myself? Christ gives us the answer in the great com commandment. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all that it and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. It sounds so easy, but it's really challenging to do. Whenever I'm, I'm working with teenagers, whenever I come across kids my own age, I always ask them, you know, hey, do you want to come to church? And it's always, nah, it's just a bunch of rules. This whole book, it's just telling me how to live my life. You don't know me, you don't know my life, and all these different things. But whenever you think about it, what Jesus says here is everything is summed up in these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with everything that you have. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the laws, this whole book is summed up in those two things. When we love God with everything that we have, we want to do what he says in his word. He tells us, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. 
The same way as with a husband or a wife or with our kids, if we love them, then we'll want to do things for them. And the thing that I love about this is that the rules and the law that Jesus gives us isn't just to tell us what to do or to control us, but it's because he knows the effects that if we don't, we won't be able to have the greatest life possible. I always hear in college, you know, oh man, I went to this party and I went to this party. If you don't have this, if you don't have this, if you don't have the hottest girl, if you don't drink, if you don't do drugs, if you don't, you know, get, get a PhD and lots of money and become a lawyer or a doctor and all these different things, then you're not living, you're not successful. And I think that there's so many times that we can listen to those voices and instead of listening to the word of God where we think that we might be missing out on something. When I was talking to Gene, we were talking about the cost of discipleship. That's what... I titled this message before was the cost of discipleship but as I was talking to Gene we were talking about how we look at the cost being as a negative but when Jesus asks us to give up those things what he's really saying is I'm gonna give you the best life possible and so it doesn't really cost us anything the world tells us that if we don't have these things then we're missing out but Jesus says no you're missing out if you do those those things because it'll take away what I've intended for you. And I went to Jim Elliott Christian School. Jim Elliott made a, a quote famous. Everybody called him a fool because he gave up everything to be a missionary. And he said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And so these things that we give up, these sacrifices that we make to live a, a holy life, to follow God, to be his disciple, isn't really costing us anything at all. Everything that we give to Jesus, we gain whenever we follow his commands because he's the one who designed our life. I told God whenever I was growing up, I said, God, I never want to go to Mexico. I never, ever want to go to Africa. God, please don't ever send me to Africa. Those are the only two places I've ever been. <laughs> And if I would have listened to my old self, if I would have listened to those, those fears, those anxieties, I would have missed out on a blessing that I couldn't dare hope for. And so God asks us to give up certain things, but he gives those to us. If we deny ourselves according to the great commandment, that means that we have to have absolute sacrifice through obedience to Jesus. Absolute sacrifice of our selfishness. He takes it, to a deeper level with his 12 disciples, this is what he says. He says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And that verse always hits me because I have to ask myself every day, did I love the way that Jesus wanted me to? Did I love God with everything that I have? Did I give him my very best? And then I also have to ask myself, how did I love other people today? Even when I'm driving. <laughs> it drives me nuts. Whenever I'm, I always, I live out in Aurora, and I'll be coming down C470. It's, it's meant to be 65. It's a bright, sunny day, and every time that there's a curve, somebody will hit their brakes. <laughs> and we'll go 45 around the curve, and I'm like, they made it for 65, you know, and I get so frustrated, but I'm like, I have to be loving, I have to be loving, patience, patience, you know, and so how many times in a day am I unloving? How many times in a day did I not do the things that God wanted me to because of fear? When you see that being a Christian and being a disciple calls for love, obedience, and sacrifice, are there things that get in the way of us being disciples. Relationships, finances, work, fears, anxiety. If there's anything getting in the way, we have to recognize it as disciples of Jesus because a lot of times those things get in the way of us truly loving one another, truly loving God. Over Thanksgiving, I went... Um, and saw the movie Frozen. It's a Disney movie, and I took some kids, and um, I thought it was gonna be more like Snowman, more of a Christmassy movie, 
And I was watching it, and it turned out to be a total, like, princess love story. <laughs> and I took all boys, and so we were kind of looking at each other like, oh, <laughs> maybe next time we'll go, we'll go somewhere else. <laughs> but it was funny because there's always that aspect that we're taught that love is always about romance. It's all about the fuzzy fuzzies. It's all about the lovey-dovey. And it's all about this emotion. And I think that sometimes growing up, I always got a weird idea of what love is. I watched all the Disney movies. Aladdin was my favorite. But it always has to do with true love's first kiss. That, those butterflies and all of that. And so sometimes I know that I, I can have a mixed up view of what love is. The world tells you that love is when people adore you, when people compliment you, when people, you know, just do all of these different things and, and it's an emotion and, and it's so easy to fall out of love with everyone and it's so this and so that. And I love that Jesus gives us in 1 Corinthians 13, he tells us what love is. And he says this, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no records of being wronged. It does not rejoice in injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. And I love that verse because God tells us in his word that he is love. And so whenever I read that, God is patient and kind. And how true that is. But then, as we start to talk about how we love God, do we love Jesus that way? Are we patient? Are we kind? Are we not jealous or boastful or proud or rude? Do we not demand our own way? And then to take it a step further, do I love that way? And so I put my name in there. Mike is patient and kind. Mike is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. He does not demand his own way. He is not irritable and he keeps no records of being wrong. He does not rejoice in injustice but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Mike never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And I look at that list and as I say my own name, I say, I really need to work on that one. Especially when driving. Um... I need to work on that one because I remember what he did to me, right? I remember what it, she said about me. I give up a lot. And so it's a challenge for disciples of Jesus. We need to be asking ourselves, do we love this way? Am I patient? Am I kind? Am I jealous or boastful or proud or rude? And so then we start to ask ourselves and then we start to say, I'm not so good in this area. I really need to work on this. And you don't have to do the whole thing all at once, but just pick one. If I'm not being patient in my love, then I'm going to work on that this week. If I'm, if I'm rude, I need to really work on that. These are the things that we as disciples of Jesus need to be asking ourselves daily. And I want to ask you, how about you? Do we love Jesus this way? Do you have all of these attributes when dealing with others? What is getting in the way of being completely sold out for Jesus? Something that I would like for all, all of us to do, if you want to, is in your bulletin, um, you have a little note card. And I'm gonna go first. The thing that gets in the way of me pleasing the Lord in being a disciple for him is I allow myself to be dictated by what other people think of me. I'm a people pleaser. And so there's often times when Jesus is telling me, Mike, I really want you to say this or I really want you to do this, Mike, and I get scared. And I say, you know, ah, ah and, and so I might go halfway. But I'm challenged in myself because I want to give Jesus everything. And so what we're going to do is I want you to write down if there's anything getting in the way of you having a relationship with Jesus and being a sold out disciple. Maybe it's, maybe it's finances. Maybe it's a mortgage. Maybe it's retirement. Maybe it's stressing out about, you know, what am I gonna do? Maybe it's fear. 
Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's, you know, I really worry about my kids and I've, I've been putting that above Jesus. Whatever it is, I want you to write on this card. Nobody's going to look at these. I want you to write down, I'm going to put, I'm a people pleaser. And then what we're going to do, I forgot how to spell it. There we go. Is fold it over and we're going to lay it at the foot of the cross. Because we just talked about how God tells us to hate everything, give up everything. And so what I want you to do is I want you to fold that up. I want you to throw it at the foot of the cross. We're going to shred these after every service. Nobody's going to look at them. And then what I want you to do is I want you to come up to this little bowl, and I want you to pick up one of these little crosses as a reminder. We got these for everybody. And so um, you can drill a little hole in it, put it on a keychain, maybe a necklace, just to remind you that in 2014, I want to take up my cross. And I want to live sold out. I want to be a disciple for Jesus. I want to take my relationship with him to the next level. And so um, if you don't have a card, if there wasn't one in your bulletin or if you're sharing a bulletin, we also have some extra cards and extra pins up here if you'd like to. And so the worship team is going to come out. And as they play these next two songs, at any point in the two songs, we want you guys to come up and to drop it as a commitment to say in 2014, this is who I'm going to be for the Lord. That's what I love about New Year's. And just like what I said, whenever I totally said, God, I'm going to do whatever you want, and I went to Africa, I got to do things that I never thought that I would. I, I got to speak on the radio to four different countries with Pastor Ian and with my good friend Ashley. And we got to talk with people uh, going down to Mexico. We're taking our trip, and we get to love on Javier and, uh, and encourage him. And so it's the same thing. Don't miss out on your relationship with Jesus. Don't miss out on the life that he intended you to have this year. Because once I gave in and once I gave him everything, I had a life that I couldn't dare hope for. So as we sing these next couple songs, come. Thanks.